Hey and welcome. My name is Dr. Kalanicki and this is Elementary Ed TPA Task 4, Assessment Commentary Prompts 1 and 2. Now, this video is specifically designed for my students in my EDI 613 class at LIU on Long Island, which is a math methods class for elementary ed students, and not actually student teaching yet, but I feel like this video may be helpful for others of you who are out there working on your ed TPA in student teaching right now. So here we go. So your math assessment commentary is a document um, that you are required to submit for your ed TPA as part of task four. Um, you need to use the template provided. You cannot delete any of the prompts, so that does take up some of your space. Um, and the commentary can be no more than, five, uh, than eight pages. So be careful about your space limits. Um, a, a very good assessment commentary should just about fit in those pages. Again, those recommendations on page sizes, um, you should use every amount of space possible if you're answering the questions fully and completely. Uh, prompts 1 and 2 you can complete after you uh, teach your learning segment or your CT teaches your learning segment um, and you give your assessment. Other videos that may be helpful for you at this moment uh, would be the learning segments video if you haven't done it yet and my video on assessments that talks specifically about what should be in your assessment for ed TPA. Okay, so in preparation to write this, you should have your learning segment done in front of you. You should have evaluation criteria. Now that is a separate part that is not part of the commentary. That's called part D if you look at your handbook. Um, but you should consider um, that document. I suggest, and you'll see in some of the samples that I provided in this video, that it could be something like a chart that talks about um, what kinds of work would be shown to get full credit, partial credit, or no credit on a, different questions. And the questions may be based on um, certain objectives or maybe even parts of the CPP, which I will talk about. That's conceptual um, understanding, procedural fluency, and problem solving. You should have copies of your students' work. And I'm highly recommending you take multiple copies of your students' work. Um, obviously, you want to grade these and get them back to your students right away. So before you grade them, run them through the copier at least three times. Um, grade your set that you need to grade and give it back to the students. Um, you might want to keep a copy of the graded set for yourself as well. Um, I would grade one set completely on your own based on your evaluation criteria. I would recommend keeping the students' names on it for the beginning, but then your final submissions, um, those names have to be redacted and any identifying information like the school name or your, your cooperating teacher's name needs to be removed from those documents. And in its place, um, the students that you will be using, Focus Student 1, Focus Student 2, Focus Student 3 would be written on those samples. Once you have that student work, you should be able to pick your three focus students by the time prompt one is done. Okay, so let's get into prompt one. Prompt one is an analysis of your whole class's learning. So part A is asking you to identify the learning objectives. Obviously, you're going to get that information from your learning segment, but it should be specifically based on your learning segment as well as the assessment. So the assessment might not have touched on every objective that you taught in your learning segment or that your CT taught in your learning segment. Um, so be sure that it is specific to your assessment that you gave your students. Uh, prompt B, 1B, asks for a graphic or a narrative that summarizes student learning. Um, and it says be sure to include all of the learning based on the evaluation criteria. So my recommendation would be to start with that evaluation criteria and kind of adjust it. Um, for your use. I'll show you an example. The two examples are from student uh, pre-student teachers that completed my class last semester. Again, it's a little more simplistic. I'll show you uh, a little bit of a better example um, on my next slide, but again, just so you can see patterns of you know questions that were successful, questions that were not successful, um, mastered, progressing, struggling, right? So that would be similar to my full credit, partial credit, no credit um, suggestion. These two actually go together. This was one of my students' work from last semester. Notice on this table, he has the evaluation criteria. Um, so it's already there in the table. So you can take your evaluation criteria and actually modify it. Um, so this would, you would not maybe necessarily need to have all of this in your um, commentary. Instead, you would just have the you know fractions, how many out of how many students 
you know, achieved that level. Um, this also went with this student's work, and this, again, focused on the three levels of CPP, concepts, procedures, and problem solving. And here the student identified the three focused students based on uh, similar weaknesses. Here's a student that I had last semester, student teaching. Um, this was a secondary math uh, educator, uh, pre-service educator. So as you see again, they have the question number, the objective, and then full credit, partial credit, no credit with fractions and percentages um, of the students that achieve those. So I kind of like it, again, as a math teacher, that's just, that just makes my heart happy. So um, again, I would recommend probably starting with your evaluation criteria and then modifying it um, and deleting the criteria and just sticking with you know, the fractions and the percents. Okay, prompt 1C. Uh, specifically asked for you to use examples from your summary chart or the narrative that discusses the patterns of learning. So again, we're talking about an analysis. I'm not talking about a summary. I'm talking about what your students did on your assessments. I actually should change that word from generally summarize to analyze. Um, but you want to specifically comment on conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, and problem solving. So here's an example I just kind of threw off the top of my head. For example, on question three, which focused mainly on students' conceptual understanding of fractions, nine out of ten students received partial credit and one out of ten students received full credit. So there you go. Again, you might want to go into even more detail explaining what kinds of que what kind of question question three was, what was it asking students to do. Um, again, that could be helpful. You could pull that from the evaluation criteria as well. But again, touching on all three types. If you don't believe your assessment has all three types, I would highly recommend my video on assessments. Go back and revise your assessment, and you can always give it to students um, again if needed. I mean, you got to do what you got to do to make sure your EdTPA uh, is covering the assessment types that they're asking you to cover. Okay, moving on to prompt two. So now you have kind of that whole analysis, so you should be able to pick your three focused students. At least one must be uh, a student that's identified as having a specific learning need, and that's from your context from learning. Um, and all three students should have similar patterns of struggle. So what did they struggle with? Um, was it conceptual understanding? Was it the procedural fluency? Was it the problem solving? Was it more than one? And maybe one you know, caused difficulty with the other two? You know, Think about specifically, because again, you're focused on what can I target additional instruction for for my re-engagement lesson. So that's what you really want to hit on is which three students can I pull and I can teach one extra lesson to and that will help them. Prompt 2A is really just um, a prompt that just asks in what form will you submit your work samples. Um, for most of my students and for most of the students in uh, EDI 613, this is going to be written work samples in text files. So you're going to have to take the samples uh, take out the student's names, any identifying information, write focus student one, and scan it into a text file. Um, you, can, you do have the option of audio and video files, which I will talk about uh, in a few slides. But in this prompt, you're literally just deleting the ones that you, you didn't use. For prompt 2B, again, we're focused on those three samples. And you want to select students again. You should have selected students that have similar struggles. So you have to cite specific examples um, from CPP from their work. So start with a general statement. All three students struggled with the conceptual understanding of fractions. And now we go into specifics. Focus student one wrote a ratio that represented the shaded area comparing it to the non-shaded area of the figure in question four. Okay, so obviously had some difficulty understanding what a fraction really means and a numerator and denominator really mean. Focus student two demonstrated similar struggle in understanding what the numerator and denominator in a fraction should represent as they reversed the numbers in question three. So again, writing the numerator as a denominator, denominator as a numerator. And again, I would go into all three students citing specific examples from their work. Okay, moving on. Yep, here we go. Moving on, continuing to prompt 2C. Um, this, this prompt is only if you're using audio or video samples. So here you would just describe visually or with a timestamp for your audio sample which student is which. Um, so you would say, oh, the student with the red shirt is student one, the student with the blue shirt is student two, um, the student who spoke at one minute and 30 seconds is student A, you know, one. Um, 
I would recommend video and audio samples though when you're working specifically with younger students or students who have specific difficulties with language or writing because you're thinking about you know work samples and typically younger students and typically students um, that are English language learners students with disabilities may struggle more with some of those things depending on what kind of math concepts you're talking about and how um, you're teaching them you want to be sure if you're doing then a video or an audio that your questioning and your activities that the students are completing fulfill all the components of CPP so a good idea you might want to check out my video on questioning as well as the one on assessments that talks about the three different types of questions that you'd be asking uh, for CPP. Final thoughts. Obviously, as a math educator, you want to analyze your data mathematically, making sure that you are organizing your thoughts in a really um, structured way. Again, like that prime example of my secondary math student. Uh, choose your focus students thoughtfully. Again, they should have similar difficulties. You want to cite specific, specific examples from your students' work and refer to specific components of CPP, conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, and problem solving. And that brings us to the end of the video. If you like this one, um, there is another one that I'm going to be doing which addresses prompts three and four, as well as a few other videos that you may find helpful to complete your EdTPA task four. Thanks so much for joining me.